Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, first, you should know that we had some technical issues uh, with the Google Plus Hangouts. Uh, so this is actually being broadcast live on uh, Brother Jackson's channel on YouTube. It's called Mecha Wing Zero. So uh, uh, once it's, uh, the live broadcast is completed, we'll upload this onto my, uh, my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So fortunately, we're able to find some way to uh, work our way through the technical difficulties, and we're still going to be able to do this hangout. And uh, we've been talking about heaven for uh, nine episodes now, a total of 18 hours. <laughs> And uh, this, so this is episode 10 on the, on the subject of heaven. We're, what we're doing is we're going through this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven. Randy Alcorn. We're reading the book together and discussing it. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me so far. Uh, let's introduce all the panelists. Start with uh, Brother Austin. Hey, everybody. My name is Austin. My channel's name is Austin Bell. I run a ministry called Christ Ministries, and uh, glad to be here. Okay, thank you, Brother Austin. Okay, and uh, now we got Brother Eric. Hey, Brother Eric here. YouTube channel is Jesus Knight Seventy Two, and um, as always, excited to talk about heaven here tonight. Okay, thanks for joining us. And 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 now we have Brother Jackson. And he gets two rounds of applause. The first applause is because he was able to salvage the day. And, and he was able to get the Hangout running on his channel. And so we're still able to do it. So thank you for that. Hello, Brother Jackson. No problem. No problem. Um, it's great to be here. I feel super powerful controlling the Hangout right now. <laughs> and, anyway, and um, if, if you're watching this on my channel, comment and let me know, because I'm not entirely sure, because a lot of people have their subscriptions private, who's even watching my channel and everything. But if you know anything about me and you've been following Brother Luke and everything, you know that I'm a free grace, Christian, college nerd sort of person. And I'm really, really glad to be here, and I'm really glad that we can have Bible talk tonight, not just do nothing because of technical difficulties. So, Okay, all right. Thank you, Jackson. And uh, next we have Brother Mitch. Yes, hello, everybody. Brother Mitch. Um, it's a pleasure to be beamed up to uh, Mecha Wing Zero's ship. We are broadcasting from outer space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, Brother Mitch. It's, uh, uh, we missed you last time, but particularly uh, the, the humor that you add to the show. Uh, not that, not that you, you do not have some very uh, wonderful uh, biblical insights to offer, but we also like that humor. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first, let me say, uh, if you can see, I don't know if... I might have messed up my camera settings too, but Jackson asked me since I did this differently. So, can you read this shirt? Oh yeah. Far away. Yep. What's it say? Only Jesus can save you. Okay. Now, what's it say on the back? Eat at Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get. I, we can't quite see at the angle you're at. You have to stand at. up a little bit more there, Luke. Yeah. yeah. Move to your. This is. This is not. Working out very well. Move to your left. <laughs> yeah, the move to your left. There you go. go. Now talk so this picture gets big. What's it say? Only What's Jesus, say? God, Lord, Savior. Okay. All right. So Jackson suggested, since my camera was uh, not zooming in as much, I, he thought it would be a good idea for me to wear some of these Christian shirts. And This is a shirt that I've worn uh, many times out street preaching. And, not just street preaching, but just walking around in life. You know, you go to a movie or you go to the to a grocery store and wherever you wear these types of shirts, uh, it's a way of. Uh, I made a video. Let's advertise for Jesus, not Calvin Klein. <laughs> so, a lot of people will wear clothing with uh, some uh, clothing maker's name all over it. But I'm saying, why don't you wear some clothing with the name Jesus on it and advertise for him? 
But you're not telling me I can never wear a, a shirt with a mecca on it or something. No, you, can, you cannot use wear any shirt uh, with any other name on it. Uh, otherwise, it's idolatry. Okay, so then we not, can, we're going to have to stop this broadcast because I have Mecha Wing Zero, and I was going to play the Gundam Seed theme song before the show started. <laughs> oh, man, theme music and everything now? All right. Yeah. May, we may need uniforms for this. Yeah. I'm thinking a little Trekkie with some kind of symbol over there. Yeah, although not Trekkie, it's Gundam. Let's Gundam. get this right. you got to make your own logo. <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't know what that would what look like, but, you know, and then the, the, your, 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 your title, captain, lieutenant, whatever it is, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, all right. Let's get uh, into the topic here of heaven. Uh, we are, uh, let me see, we've done 18 hours, so this is the beginning of the 19th hour on heaven. Uh, and uh, we actually, the weird thing about this is uh, this is by far the most comprehensive t topic I've ever uh, studied uh, or discussed on one of these panels. And uh, we've only so far scratched this, barely scratched the surface. So heaven is a, a vast subject, and it's a very joyful subject. So let's continue where we left off last time. We're on page 115 of Randy Alcorn's book. And let me see. He says, uh, the difference between Adam and Christ is not that one was a physical being and the other wasn't. It was that Adam was under sin and the curse, and Christ was untouched by sin and the curse. Jesus was and is a human being, quote, in every respect like us, unquote. That's Hebrews 2.17. Uh, how about, Eric, you look up Hebrews 2.17. This is in the sure. NLT, uh, uh, except with respect to sin, okay? Okay. Uh, so though Jesus in his resurrected body proclaimed, I am not a ghost, that's uh, Luke 24, 39, uh, countless Christians think they will be ghosts in the eternal heaven. I know this because I've talked with many of them. They think they'll be disembodied spirits or wraiths. That's spelled with a W, W-R-A-I-T-H-S. We should have Jack Smack with us tonight to define these words here. I've never heard the word wraith. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like from the Lord of the Rings, I think. Right, oh. right. It's a, it's a spirit being a, a a ghost type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as soon as my channel hosts it, we we can't get off the fiction thing. I love it. <laughs> okay, the the magnificent cosmos shaking victory of Christ's resurrection, by definition, a physical triumph over physical death, in a physical world, escapes them. If Jesus had been a ghost, if if we would be ghosts, then redemption wouldn't have been accomplished. So remember where we left off last time. This is just a continuation with that. Is that uh, this victory, uh, Christ paying for our sins and being raised from the dead? This is the victory, uh, and it's our redemption. But it's it's a physical result. We have eternal life in a physical body, just as G Jesus was resurrected with a physical body, not just some spirit. All right? So uh, feel free to interrupt or comment at any point if you find something uh, you want to add to that or comment. I was thinking about Jesus eating at Peter's restaurant. I heard the fish was really good. Well, I... Uh, I think Jesus is the one that invited him to dinner. He, Jesus was the cook. Did Jesus cook? Because I thought he was hungry. He asked for some fish. <laughs> no, he had cooked fish already cooked and prepared for them when they got off the boat, remember? Oh, well, actually, I believe it or not, was, he was resurrected, though. Believe it or not, this is bringing out a point that I've uh, thought about for a while. This jesting is the idea of if we're physical in heaven... That, that probably follows that there's going to be food in heaven and everything. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and the more, the, and obviously eating is one of the pleasures of life, like eating a really good meal or something like that. And it seems like it would follow that eating seems to be a very physical thing. You know, your body needs the energy from the atoms and molecules and the food and everything. And 
is the, the, the feast of the Lamb on, on earth as we know it right now, or is that in heaven? Or where Does anyone know where that is off the top of their head? I had some lamb the other night. Pretty good, but um, I, I, I know that it's going to be with Christ when he returns, whether the kingdom is going to be set up, and from what we were saying, the kingdom is going to be here. Well, the, the feast of the lamb does not mean that the, the people are going to be eating lamb. That's not why it's called the feast of the lamb. It, mean, it means that we're, we'll have a feast, a celebration in heaven. Uh, um, what we'll be eating, I don't know, but the lamb referenced in that would be the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Right. right. So will we be eating in eternity? Uh, there's future chapters. We'll go into great detail on that. But uh, So uh, what's your first response? I mean, uh, will there be any need to eat? Uh, will we... Uh, and if we eat, are we going to be digesting it with a regular digestive system and excreting it through an excretory system as we had now? Or, I mean, I don't know. But we'll go, as I said, we'll go into greater detail in, in other chapters on this subject. Okay, uh, Jesus walked the earth in his resurrection body for 40 days, showing us how we would live as resurrected human beings. In effect, he also demonstrated where we would live as resurrected human beings on earth. Christ's resurrection body was suited for life on earth, not primarily life in the intermediate heaven. As Jesus was raised to come back to live on earth, so we will be raised to come back to live on earth. Uh, he cites uh, two verses here. Uh, would you look this up? Uh, Jackson, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. And Austin, could you look up Revelation 21, verse 1 through 3? You said 1, 13 in 1 Thessalonians? One, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. 4, 14, okay. Revelation 21, 1 through 3? Yeah. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the new heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Okay, and how about uh, Jackson's verse? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14 reads, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Okay, so these two verses are supporting the point that we've been studying for the last couple of episodes, is that uh, this... this uh, in eternity, we're not going to be in some spirit realm, uh, non-physical, uh, for eternity. We're going to be actually on the earth. The earth will be recreated uh, back into paradise, as it was with Adam and Eve, but better. Uh, and, and we people will be resurrected uh, just as we are right now with physical bodies, but better bodies that uh, never get sick or die. Uh, and we're going to be living on earth. So we've, we've already discussed that point quite a bit in the past, but uh, as I've said before, this is something that you know we're already quite familiar with, but do you think that the people in the church are, have any clue as to this? I mean, if you mention it, I remember mentioning this to uh, a relative of mine once uh, who's a Roman Catholic, and she, she's really, very really, very religious, uh, but uh, I... I told her this was in the Bible and she was like she was like shocked and like and almost like oh don't even tell me that because she can't read the Bible because you know a Roman Catholic can't be trusted with reading the Bible you've got to just listen to the priest but so so many people this is so foreign to them they have no clue mm -hmm. wait why, can we go back real fast what, what was so important well, uh, your typical professing Christian doesn't realize that we're going to have physical bodies in eternity. 
They don't realize that we're going to be on earth in eternity. And isn't, isn't that amazing that Christendom as a whole, I would say that probably 90% of all Christendom are, uh, are in error on, on eternity. Okay. It's so strange. You know, I, I don't know how to, I don't know what my take on these people are. And there's so many of them out there that um, it seems to me that maybe what their real mark on is that their whole reason for Christianity is to say that they how well they've done it on earth. Well, look, the other thing that puzzles me about these people to build on Mitch's thought is, you know, as Christians, I guess unless we're really, really carnal Christians, we should have a desire to know what the book we believe about salvation really says about things. And that's why all of us are here trying to dig into the Bible and everything. And I guess it just shows that most people just don't care, it seems like. Mm -hmm. you, would, oh, you, would, you would think that people would be more concerned or more interested in what the greater portion of their existence is going to pertain to. Not and and you could raise that question just as much for salvation as you can for the idea of heaven. Just salvation in general, the idea that you know you spend this very short time on earth. What about eternity? You know, um, it's it's as if they don't think about the greater portion of their existence, the longer period they're going to exist, which is not in this body, but in a new resurrected body in eternity, doing things that you know we're not even sure all the things we're going to be now. So what's the focal point of their faith? That's my question. What are they really focusing on? Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the um, assuming they're believers, it kind of reminds me of the the parable of the sower. The uh, the the third group. It says that they received the word, but then they were caught up with the thorns and the concerns of the world and all of that stuff. And unfortunately, that probably describes a lot of Christendom. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you're right. And on the, other, on the other side of that, and this is just what Mitch said also clicked something too, is where are their treasures stored? You know, if, if Jesus says, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, you know, where moth does not eat, you know, and, and thieves do not come in and steal, if their focus and their treasures were in heaven, don't you, don't you think that they would be a little more concerned and, and uh, interested in heaven? Where their treasures are stored? <laughs> Makes me wonder what their real interest is. Exactly. Is it, is, is it on themselves? Is it <coughs> running the race to the end to say that I did it? Mm -hmm. But no reason for it except for personal, to be able to say in eternity that I left my mark, I did my thing. Or is that why is that why prosperity gospel is so... Uh, so prevalent today because you know because people are more interested in storing treasures for themselves here. They're not really concerned with them. Mm -hmm. Well, I made a video uh, ways back titled "Truly Saved," and uh, I make the point in that that uh, it seemed like everybody is anxious to point the finger of suspicion at other believers and challenge whether they, you think they're truly saved or not and based upon you know how they're living their lives and uh, you know no no one on the panel uh, is like that uh, we, we understand that person's salvation is not based upon uh, how they live their lives it's based upon uh, who they believe in uh, and yet uh, it, it makes you wonder though uh, if a person's you Mitch brought up the word term focal point. Uh, I used the term in my statement of faith, the object of my faith. The object of my faith is a person. Jesus Christ, God who became a man and died for me. And so uh, my faith is in this person. And my focus of my life is I think about Jesus every day. Throughout the day. I'll, I'm always thinking about Jesus and I love to talk about Jesus. And now we're talking about heaven because we love to think of our future, what, what Jesus has promised us. And yet, when we compare our experiences, our, uh, our, our apparent love for Jesus and our apparent interest in our future and eternity, uh, compare that to the vast majority of Christendom, uh, it's, it's tempting to, for people to say, well, I wonder if they're really even saved because they don't seem to be thinking about Jesus as much as us, or they don't even spending time thinking about heaven. It's uh, what is their focal point in life, you know? 
so we have to guard against that and I realize that that doesn't mean they're not saved, but it isn't it surprising that more of these Christians are not just kind of obsessed. You know, some people have obsessive personalities. Well, that can be a bad thing, but it's a good thing to be obsessed with Jesus and eternity. Well, and here's the here's the other thing, Luke. About I I I think one of the problems I think that actually distracts people, ironically, from thinking about this is. What we hear in a lot of churches is what I call the purpose gospel. Not to be confused with the prosperity gospel, but they act like, you know, oh, if you if you give your life to Jesus, he'll give you a meaning in life, and you can live a meaningful life and everything. And the problem is people think about not eternal life, but they think about their life here and right now. And even if even if the person's a professing Christian, or maybe even they are they are a Christian who just got mixed up mixed up with this system and everything. They start thinking, oh, Jesus is the Lord of my life, or whatever, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And because they don't understand that the gospel is is not finding a purpose in life, it's just accepting a free gift, they are just focusing on their pur purpose right now in this material life, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but the point I'm, I'm asking, or making, and then also asking you about is, is uh, uh, <laughs> that was funny. Okay, look, don't bark at us. Yeah, right? was that you? Yeah, oh, look. that's our dog. All right, it was calm down, calm us. down. That you sounded like, that sounded like... We get it. I know we're a little slow. But, you know, now you're making me really nervous. It sounded like, like Mitch, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was our dog. So. Oh, okay. It wasn't me. Uh, I tell you what, that really threw me off, man. If I was in the middle of a sermon right now and I heard that old barking dog, I wouldn't know what to say next. <laughs> yeah, that uh, I think I, I think I was saying that uh, when we 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 naturally have this love for Jesus and this interest in the Bible and interest in eternity, and when we see that there are so many Christians that do not seem to have the same level of interest. Um, uh, one, do you, do you think that is any kind of indication that if someone, hey, are, are they really saved because would, aren't they more likely to have developed this kind of interest if they're saved and, uh, and it isn't, why, why wouldn't they just, when, if they understand how much Jesus loves us and what he did for us and what he's promised for us, how could they not just like obsessively love him? Maybe they don't, they don't believe that they've attained it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a speculation, but but maybe it, it is that it seems like it's unreachable, or that it, it's untouchable for here, or or they they really don't realize what they have, and so maybe they don't think they deserve it. You know, I, I really wish I could get into the to the working ideas here in people's head as to why their focus is here, and the the other the other only other thing is is that because. The world is here and now. We don't see heaven right now, so everybody looks at what's going on. Mm -hmm. They don't look at heaven, but looking at heaven is what you what gives you perspective for here. We get lost with here, and we lose focus of what's up there. Yeah, yeah, and it also helps us to cope with life now, because life now is a mixture of of of, of uh, joy and and sadness. And no, nobody, nobody has a life of complete joy right now, uh, and, and 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 hopefully nobody has a, a life of just nothing but sadness and tragedy right now either. But but um, at best we have a uh, some kind of a combination of joy and sadness, and, and uh, so when we have the sadness though, uh, and we we it gives us uh, the ability to cope with it, knowing that what is in store for us for in eternity. Well, the one thing I can say for sure, as, as I see it, is, is that it's important to give people focus on this, to give them encouragement that this place exists and it's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think a lot. I'm glad Mitch said that because he reminded me of something because, you know, often you hear a lot of complaints or negative things. You know, we do the – we do – these videos and, and we post them for people to see and people have their fair share of negative comments we talk about as people you know but at the same time you you hear the people who were encouraged and the way they're encouraged 
Um, and it makes you feel really good. You know, it, it makes you feel like th that one or two people that, that come out of it watching it and hearing about heaven and say, wow, I'm getting so much from this. I, I, I feel so much better in my life thinking about this and focusing on this. You know, that makes it worthwhile and it makes the message worth saying to these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it says, the risen Jesus walked and talked with two disciples on the Emmaus Road. That's Luke chapter 24. They asked him questions. He taught them and guided them in their understanding of Scripture. They saw nothing different enough about him to tip them off to his identity until, quote, their eyes were opened, unquote. Uh, this suggests that God had prevented them from recognizing Jesus earlier, which they otherwise would have. The point is that they didn't see anything amiss. They saw the resurrected Jesus as a normal, everyday human being. The soles of his feet didn't hover above the road. They walked. Uh, they wa he walked on it. Uh, no one saw bread going down in a transparent esophagus when he swallowed. Uh, so here he is. Uh, you know, I I know Mitch and I have both talked about the road to Emmaus numerous times in our in our videos, and it, to me, it's one of the most wonderful uh, events in the Bible, uh, I think. And, and uh, but the point Randy Alcorn is making is is simply that uh, if he was just a spirit, they would have noted noted it. They would have said it. You know, he was he appeared as a physical person. I find that two things interesting. One, it shows that he's definitely physical, and two, uh, why didn't they recognize him at first? My guess is that his appearance had changed somewhat since after the resurrection. Like I do think we're, we might we're, we'll we'll probably still retain our good physical features, but I I think of us as as um, looking kind of different in eternity, not. Having a bunch of like I, I don't know like especially these people who they might die in their 90s or something and they're saved or whatever I don't think they'll be in a wheelchair with the wrinkly skin and have. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's very good. No, I agree. I think Jackson's I think Jackson's right on the money there. I think he's I think he's exactly right. It's like people people get this idea that it's like everybody's going to be uh, around the. Maybe around the age that Christ was when he when he died, you know, thirty three or so in his thirties or around that area. Um, yeah, it's sort of everybody will kind of be in that in that age group. I've, I've heard if, people if, say if that. You if you retained your aging, you should hope you die in your prime. <laughs> right, right. I don't know. I like uh, I like I like my I like the gray in my beard. I, I really do. I, I I you know if I was twenty years old. I guess, I guess that's how you should plan to see. <laughs> Yeah. Young and yet not so young. There's a little bit of gray there, a little salt and pepper look. I, you know, I, I I've, think uh, the, I'm sorry, Luke. I, I was I, just I've mentioned... The, uh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You go, Mitch. I insist. I, I'm sorry. I just... Uh, the, the, the focal... This other word, focal point, or, the, or, the, or, or the, the one phrase that I think was the catchphrase, or punchline, if you will, of that whole story was, didn't our hearts burn all the while while he was with us? And I really think that that was a picture on purpose of Christ not having them recognize who he was until the end so that they could talk about the things and bring these things up and their hearts could burn and yearn and at that point when when, when, they're, when they're seeking him all of a sudden he shall appear mm -hmm. so I, I just think that that was it, it, you know that one step one line didn't our hearts you know in our in us burn or, or, or weren't we passionate about it when we were speaking about these things Mm -hmm. uh, I've mentioned numerous times uh, a Bible teacher, uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman, and, and I, he, he stated that he believes everybody in eternity is going to have be the age of 33. As I, who is that, Eric? Did you say that? Yeah. I, I don't know if, if that is uh, other people hold to that, but Dr. Ruckman wrote about that. And because is that like the, the peak age? And Jesus was 33, and so that's like the ideal age, I guess, in in some people's eyes. But uh, we talked last time about will someone who's obese will they will they be obese in eternity? If someone has a feature 
like a very large nose that they, and they don't like it, will they still have that feature? Uh, Jackson just brought up, well, what about someone that's 90? Wouldn't they rather be in eternity at the you know, younger age instead of being old and decrepit, old age in a wheelchair? <laughs> so um, I, I'm not sure. And what about little infants and children if, who died too young? You know, are they going to be adults? These are things we can guess and try to figure out. But I'm also interested in this idea that they didn't recognize him. Now, Randy Alcorn mentioned that uh, God kind of covered their eyes and they couldn't see him or something in some way, uh, uh, blinded them to the fact of who it was. But uh, uh, I think it's, it's just as likely that he was able to actually change his appearance. And, and in science fiction, we have this uh, phenomenon called shapeshifters, uh, some kind of a, a being that is able to change his f f shape into any, anything. And uh, it seems to me that maybe Jesus was it just changed his shape, uh, his, his appearance. And then when he decided to reveal himself to them, he made himself to be Jesus so that they, they could recognize him. Uh, what, do you have any ideas on that? Well, I wonder if we're, um, yeah, if we can be shape, shape shifting sounds like something that could be possible. But I've, what I've always thought is we'll be, I don't know, like 20 or 30 years old or some, somewhere in that range. So in other words, like a nice prime age, but yet have the mind of probably like an 80-year-old without Alzheimer's or something. Because as negative as some aging effects can be, there's actually some positive effects in that you become a lot wiser and more mm -hmm. experienced. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you, you know, you really some some of these older people. It's like they're really, really smart when you talk to them and stuff. They have a thank, thank huge you. knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackson. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I'm not entirely. I think this is an attempt at humor. I don't quite get, but the, um, the my my point is, I think that aging is not 100% negative. So I think that in eternity, the positive elements will be retained with it. No, yeah. I think you're, you're right, Jackson. I mean, it's one of those things that you do gain through age is experience. I mean, you just learn things through life where, you know, some people don't. <laughs> some people, you know, some people get a little more wisdom than others, but, um, but you know, you're right. I, 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 and I totally see what you're trying to say, and, and that does make sense. And I don't know about the shape-shifting thing, but, um... I mean, I mean, could be. I mean, uh, sure, that's a possibility. Why not? We don't know. Um, it may be one of those things will be revealed to us later that it's kind of a surprise, and it's like, you'll have no idea, but you can change the way you look if you want. Um, yeah. Who knows? Maybe we can. Um, I don't think it's unrealistic. There's nothing that, there's nothing wrong with that principle. Um, but I think that also, like Jackson was saying, maybe a combination also, just maybe we will we'll be us, but we will look a little different. Uh, one of the things that I also note is that you got to remember how the people – also last saw Jesus, and he was in some pretty rough shape. I mean, you know, he was you know, marred be beyond recognition. I mean, he was beaten, he was bloodied, he was crucified, he was, you know, so, I mean, he was in pretty bad shape, and then I think people just, a lot of people also just at face value just to have this living, breathing person right next to them, and they tend to say, oh, well, that couldn't possibly be him because there's just there's no way. I saw him. You know, there, was, there was still a little doubt kind of in their, in their hearts purely because of what they had just seen him go through. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't pictures back then either. You know, the only people that really would have known him well were the people who saw his face all the time. Right, and even Mary, and even Mary, though, uh, doesn't... <laughs> Know him at first when when he speaks to her. Uh, she she you know, she calls him sir. He doesn't expect or know that it's him, um, and that might have been one of those cases where you know I'm sure she was very um, distraught. You know, distraught exactly. You know, she, here here she's coming off of the you know seeing this uh, you know th their savior their lord you know beaten mm -hmm. and treated in such a way where he's you know, like I said he's barely recognizable and. And um, it's just the human mind kind of just dissociates from that. They, they, they all they all afterwards fell into a, a, a doubt. You know, here he told them, "I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to come back." And and really, all of them kind of kind of said, "Well, they didn't really expect it." You know, they were kind of there. They were in the in the rooms, hidden, and and you know, talking about what are we going to do now? And you know, and here Jesus appears in front of them. So it's it's. It could be a combination of those things. He may have, he may, and he, his his appearance may have changed somewhat. I think they're this, all reasonable theories. This reminds me of the time I I dressed up like a rabbi and went to the people's house that I used to take care of the the family. I used to take care of a stroke patient, and they were Jewish. So put on the whole garb, 
the black coat. I put on. I had. I never usually wore glasses. The glasses. The the Jewish hat. And I knocked on the door with a Jewish accent. You know, accent. Hello, how are you? From Eretz Israel, here. I've got. I've got tried saying Kinto on Khan Gelt. I only. I, I have 13 kids and no money. You know, this is a schnorr. They knock on the door. So they came to the door and answered the door and they're handing me money and I'm saying a baruch for your family. Let me meet the head of the home. Oh, thank you. Shalom Aleichem. After a few minutes, they looked at me and then they were in shock. <laughs> so I actually fooled them. They didn't know it was me for a good five minutes. <laughs> well, it is possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I used to dress up too. I used to dress up as Batman. Uh, you know, remember when the original Batman movie came out, and I had a, got a Batman costume, and I would actually entertain at birthday parties via Batman character. <laughs> oh, but we get into, will there be superheroes in heaven? And the I think we'll all be, be super. I think we'll all be superheroes. Yeah. Well, I mean, talk about genetic way. mutation there. You know, your body, if your body's human growth hormone and 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 your neurological, you know, uh, DNA RNA uh, replication is perfect or you can even control DNA, RNA re replication, then you could do anything. And you talk about wushu, these art artists that are able to, to, to have ice cracked on their body and not be hurt, contortionist. These people can do actually do these things on Earth now. So I don't think it's too far-fetched for us to be able to be perfectly healthy or change our genetic code at will. Yeah. You know, uh, let, let me respond to what Eric said about uh, Mary seeing Jesus. Uh, that particular uh, scene was uh, portrayed in movies and also by authors. Uh, most of the time they portray it as like there's light in her eyes or something, so she doesn't see him clearly until he moves in a position where she, she can see him clearly. That's why she didn't recognize him. That, that's the way the movies represent it. But, uh, I, I'm still holding to my shapeshifter theory that maybe that's why she didn't recognize him and until he was ready to let her know who it was. But I don't uh, think she would have calmly called him sir if he appeared in such a way. I mean, if there's, if he appeared and there's a blinding light where she couldn't see him, I don't think she'd had a regular conversation calling him sir. I don't really, I don't, yeah. you know, I think, I think they got that wrong too. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, we know the resurrected Christ looked like a man because Mary called him sir. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> there you go. God, that's the very next paragraph. That You know what, Eric? You are like Mitch. You both have psychotic powers. Uncanny. <laughs> Did you know that, Jackson? They have psychotic powers. Psychotic powers? Absolutely. Yeah, very psychotic. Yes. If you only if you only knew. <laughs> this is what we're talking about, we're talking about superheroes. Luke and his uncanny panelists could be the superhero <laughs> of the <Yeah>. series. <laughs> we okay. Uh, Mary called him sir when she assumed he was the gardener. That's John uh, twenty verse fifteen. Though at first she didn't recognize his voice. When he called her by name, she recognized him, verse 16. It was then that she turned toward him. Okay, so she's acting like she wasn't even looking in that direction. Because modest women didn't look male strangers in the eye. This phrase suggests that she hadn't gotten a good look at him before. Uh, Jesus spent remarkably normal times with his disciples after his resurrection, Early one morning, he, uh, quote, stood on the shore, unquote, at a distance. That's John 21, verse 4. He didn't hover or float or even walk on water, though he could have. Uh, he stood there. He, he stood, then called to the disciples. Obviously, his voice sounded human because it traveled across the water, and the disciples didn't suspect it was anyone but a human. It apparently didn't sound like the deep, otherworldly voices that movies assign to God or angels. <clears throat> he's, he's continued to try to find all these little nuances that, that uh, give us more uh, evidence that this was indeed a human being. It wasn't a spirit that was resurrected.
uh, Jesus had started a fire and he was already cooking fish that he'd presumably caught himself. Yeah. He cooked them, which means he didn't just snap his fingers and materialize a finished meal. He invited them to add their fish to his fish and said, come and have breakfast. That's John 21, verse 12. Um, that gets the, uh, also uh, brings up the question of uh, how did he uh, feed the 5,000 and the 7,000? Where did that bread and fish come from? Uh, and this fish he, that he just cooked there, did he actually go out fishing and catch the fish the way that Randy Alcorn is suggesting? Or did, did he, does he just materialize these things or maybe transport them? Maybe the fish were in one location and he just transported them into the baskets. Wow. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, well, well I mean, I mean, <laughs> my take on that is this. Why is it so incredible to believe that Jesus simply materialized the fish? I mean, you know, in the beginning, God's God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything that's in them. When he took the molecules and atoms and he took the dust of the ground and breathed life into it and made a man out of it, I mean, why do we have a difficult time believing he could just materialize some fish? I mean, absolutely he can materialize some fish. He can materialize some cooked fish. Why not? I mean, it's... <laughs> Can you send me those fish with the gold coins in them? I need a few. What the heck? Yeah, that was. But only game. one coin per fish. That's all, man. <laughs> I get no way. There was two in there, or was it two? What was it? Just one coin. I think it was, was just it one coin. coin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you gotta, you gotta give me the mother load. You gotta give me a bigger <laughs> fish. Yeah, yeah, I like fish. I'll take a dozen. <laughs> I think uh, a, a lot of times people kind of like uh, just skim over this miracle of the loaves and fishes and without understanding the greatness of that miracle and what it really proves. Because if he could cause the fish that were, let's say, in the lake uh, and, and, and make them reappear into baskets, or maybe just bring fishes into existence that didn't even exist before, just make them exist into the, into the, uh, the baskets, the same with the bread. Uh, this, this miracle to me is, is uh, apart from uh, the resurrection of Lazarus and Dorcas and his own resurrection, uh, I can't think of anything that it would be greater than that. Uh, um, he's controlling creation. He's controlling molecules. He, you know, and, you know what he he can think it or speak it or will it to be, and it's and the fish are there. You guys aren't that impressed with the fish and loaves, I guess, huh? Oh, absolutely. I think it's so cool. delicious. <laughs> huh? It sounds delicious to me. The thought of having bread and fish. For some reason, whenever we've had fish, we haven't had bread with it. <laughs> uh, but I hear something. Um, a poem that you might like is about fish. Of all the fishies in the sea, I'd rather be a bass. They slip and slide on the seaweed and land upon their hands and knees. <laughs> hands and knees. <laughs> okay. I, you got to chuckle out of me with that, Luke. I'm sorry. Thank I, you. I, you gotta, Thank you. You're welcome. I was just looking at the, the, the other account after the road to a mosque. <laughs> and there were some bass in that one. I don't know if they had. Do they have bass in the Jordan? Is that the Jordan where they went? I don't know what they're catching they, in the Jordan. I'm not sure. You gotta find out. But uh, so it, it it says that he ate. He he took and ate in their presence. So right there in in verse 43, what's this? Luke 24. They gave Jesus some. He said, "Do you have anything here to eat?" And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and he ate it in their presence. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, so it, it's not as if he, was he not eating it? Like you said, was the esophagus like some sort of spiritual thing? And you could see like right. he'd go down there. Right. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these things are not accidents. I mean, these are not just things that uh, were just a. Uh, uh, we, we're finding all these different ways to justify this belief that this was a physical resurrection. I, I mean, I think Jesus purposely did all these things so that we could be talking about it today and say, look, these are the things that prove 
not only the eyewitnesses, but the, the accounts of the eating, uh, eating with them. Uh, uh, they, I think it was part of uh, the, the God plan to give us the proof that we need to, so we can have confidence in believing in Jesus. On the other hand, though, the doors were locked. Oh, okay, let me start, um, move back. In another appearance to the disciples, Christ's resurrection body seamlessly interacted with the disciples' mortal bodies. That's John 20, verses 19 through 23. Nothing indicates that his clothes were strange or that there was a halo over his head. He drew close enough to breathe on them, in verse 22. Uh, on the other hand, though the doors were locked, Christ suddenly appeared in the room where the disciples were gathered. Christ's body could be touched and clung to and could consume food, yet it could apparently materialize at what? as well. How is this possible? Could it be that a resurrection body is structured in such a way as to allow its molecules to pass through solid materials or to suddenly become visible or invisible? Though we know that Christ could do these things, we're not explicitly told we'll be able to. It may be that some aspects of his resurrection body are unique because of his divine nature. So you have two things here that I think are important. One is these facts about Jesus, the things that he did with his resurrected body that were supernatural and uh, superhuman. And then the other question is, uh, when we get our resur resurrected bodies, and last time we showed three verses that explicitly stated that our body will be just like his resurrected body. So uh, can we conclude then that we will also have all of these uh, abilities or does he have more abilities just because he is God and he, he can exercise these uh, powers that man, that we will never have? Uh-oh. i got to take this. Okay. You know, I think some people get – I think people get overly cautious about something and they think – they have a hard time separating um, – Certain aspects of of God, and it's for instance, if we they, they fear that if we say that our glorified bodies, though the Bible says our glorified bodies are going to be like His glorified body, and some people kind of think what's well, wrong to think that because that means I'm saying I'm just like God. Well, no, you're not. You're 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 saying your body is going to be like the risen Christ's body. Remember, nowhere are we saying that we're going to become omniscient, omnipotent, okay, omnipresent. Nobody's saying that. When we aren't going to achieve that, that's that's going to be something that's solely an aspect of God. But well, unfortunately, there are people who say that, but yeah. no one on this panel is saying that. I think. No, 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 no. I, I don't think I don't think we're ever going to gain. At least I don't think any of you believe that. I don't think we're we're never going to gain a similar in that way. We'll never be what God is ever. We'll never at be all that. at um, all at, at all. We're going to be limited. And and saying we're like the risen Christ in His glorified body. That's not saying we're like God. We're not, we're not saying we're like God. We're, he simply he simply it's it's the reverse of that. Jesus is showing us something that we are going to become. He's right. kind of I take, that's kind I of the whole very thing. strong. I take a very strong issue with deification. So I'm really glad that. Eric brought brought that up to make sh to make clear that's not what we're advocating and everything because that's no, a very very strong error in my or very very wrong error I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was a very important point to make. Let no one be confused who's watching this video that think that we're we're saying that uh, as some religions and even some Christians use the terminology little Christ, little gods. And that uh, because we're going to be like him, uh, some people say the word Christian means little Christ, and uh, uh, I say Christian means uh, one who is relying on Christ completely. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there, there, there's there's some people though that uh, think that we are going to be little gods. Mm -hmm. And then I think there are other people who are who go to the other side, like I was saying. People who think that you know it, it's wrong to say because of that, that fear of saying that they're that it's wrong. That's to not say, me. 
like the risen Christ, and and the risen Christ, that's a different thing. You know, Jesus is showing us, he's showing us what we are going to be like. And even in our glorified bodies, we are a minuscule shred of a fraction of what God could possibly be. We're still, we're, that's, that's, a, that's a vast limitation for him. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that would be a, a huge limitation for him. Let, uh, let, me, let me regress, because what you just said kind of remind me uh, of what I want to say 15, 20 minutes ago, when uh, Jackson was talking about the age, rather than being 90, wouldn't we want to be younger in, in, in heaven? And what about learning more and getting wiser as we get older? <laughs> well, I, I think I think since I'm 63, uh, I'm definitely wiser than I was, was when I was 23 and 43. Uh, but if I live to be 93, uh, whatever wisdom I am able to attain in these my life's experiences, when I get into eternity, whatever wisdom I have, <laughs> just compare 90 years of life's experiences to the amount of experience you're going to have and knowledge you're going to have acquiring over eternity. So uh, it's it's not like some people are going to go to eternity and be a lot wiser than others. You know, it's just the, the difference between someone who's 90 and someone who's 20, the wisdom that they have when they enter, that difference is going to be like not even noticeable, uh, you know, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 5 million years from now. Come on. Everybody's going to have the same amount of, almost exactly the same amount of uh, uh, life's experiences for, to, to acquire their wisdom. I don't want to be that smart. No, I'd rather it be that I don't know hardly anything. And in this way, when I, when I learn things, it's like new. You, you know, I mean... Yeah, but guess what, Mitch? Uh, no matter how much you learn, uh, it, it's just not even a drop in the bucket compared to what there is to learn. <laughs> I don't yeah, think but I don't want to have... learn anything. I just want to relax and have a good time. I'm all, you know, <laughs> studying and learning and everything like this, you know. I'd rather be... As a matter of fact, that's the wisdom I've learned in this world, is that simplicity is bliss. <laughs> yeah. Simplicity... I like that. I like I like that simplicity, not ignorance. Simplicity is bliss, and and I think a lot can be said for that. That's true. Well, simplicity, uh, and of course, we know our salvation is based upon the simplicity of our of our salvation is in putting our faith not in ourselves but in our Savior Jesus, uh, and uh, the uh, the another word that I like, Mitch, that I've learned over the years is called a moderation. In other words, learning uh, uh, from life's experiences to, to not uh, go too far extremes, moderate or balance, balancing out your life correctly and keeping everything simple. You're right. I think these are really good attributes. But in heaven, uh, in eternity, uh, I don't think we're going to ever get tired of learning. And it's not going to be like a laborious type of learning anyway. It's going to be a, a joyful learning. I, every time, like when we have these hangouts or something, and all of a sudden there's a new thought that someone gives me, some new revelation, and it's just, I get so excited about that. And it's, it's not like we're working and struggling hard to try to learn. Like I remember in college I had to work really hard and cram and try to prepare for tests, and it was not enjoyable. But the kind of learning we're going to have in eternity, I think it's just going to be nothing but pleasure. No corporate tax up there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, but we don't have any corporate tax in Nevada, Mitch. I told you, move here. You know, I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. By observing the resurrected Christ, we learn not only about resurrected bodies, but also about resurrected relationships. Christ communicates with his disciples and shows his love to them as a group and as individuals. He instructs them and entrusts a task to them. Acts, uh, will you look this up, Eric? Acts sure. 1, verses 4 through 8. If you study his interactions with Mary Magdalene, hey, Mitch, would you mind looking up this one? John 20, verse 10 through 18. John, hold on a second. Let me just plug it in here. Uh, 20. And, uh, and well, this is weird. He, it says Thomas, 
uh, like it's the book of Thomas, but I think he's still talking about the book of John. Do you think this is a typo there, Eric, the way it is? Uh, what do you mean, in, uh, in Acts? In his, no, his, in his book, uh, Randy Alcor's book. Oh, oh where, where's this? Where, I'm looking at the I'm looking top at the of page page. 117. He says, if you study his interactions with Mary Magdalene, and then he puts in parentheses, John, uh, chapter 20, verse 10 through 18, and then he says, Thomas. So his interaction with Mary, with Thomas, and Peter. But when he cites Thomas and Peter, he doesn't say the book name. I'm assuming he's still in, in John. Yeah, the book of John. Yeah. Yeah, if you study his uh, interactions with Mary you, Magdalene. Why, why, John, while you're right there, why don't you read all those? You can see the references. Yeah, I see them. Why, why don't you okay. read each of those and we can analyze the his interaction with John, Thomas, and Peter. Okay. Well, for, here's the Acts verse that you brought up. <clears throat> and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the utter, uttermost part of the earth. So that was the Acts verse. Um, okay. And the point that he's, uh, Randy Elkhorn is making in here is that uh, when Jesus was resurrected and inter interacted with these apostles, he entrusts a task to them. So he is mm -hmm. part, he's having this relationship with them, interacting with them, and telling them uh, to do a particular task. Mm-hmm. And now we talk about Mary Magdalene, Thomas, and Peter. Right. Then in John 20, it says, Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. And Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith, she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had said thus, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the point Randy Alcorn wants to make in these verses is, is, is how Jesus uh, res as a resurrected Christ it interacts with people. What about with Thomas? Uh, yeah, I see the typo you mean. He says Thomas, but he doesn't put the... <laughs> he didn't put John. <laughs> yeah, for a minute I thought he was referring to the book of Thomas. A book of Thomas. No, yeah. I think he's, he's saying John in... There 20. is a fabrication called the Gospel of Thomas. So. Yes, <laughs> that, that's not what he's referring to. He's referring yeah. to the Gospel of John. He just didn't slide it in there. He, he um... Yeah. Because right after that is what is what they're talking about, and this is when uh, Thomas is there explaining. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. You know, there's an interesting thing in that verse that I always point out to people. It doesn't say that Thomas actually winds up touching him. It just says he answers him, as if as if 
Thomas himself was wrong about what he said, and he was showing he was wrong. He saw him, heard what Jesus said, and simply says to him, my Lord and my God. It doesn't, it doesn't say, even though he stood there and said that, that he makes sure he's touched him anyway. It doesn't say that. It says, Thomas just says to him, my Lord and my God, as if to say, see, Thomas, you were wrong. You saw me, and even though you saw me and I'm just standing before you, you didn't have to touch me. You know, he says it without even having to touch him. Mm -hmm. I would have made him put his. I would have said, "Come here, give me your hand. Come here, stick your fingers. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, like that, right through." Oh. I think a lot of people get you that impression, like that's blue? what Jesus was trying to do, but he wasn't. He wasn't <laughs> doing. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure that we can come to a conclusion whether he did or did not touch him. It mm -hmm. doesn't explicitly say he did. It doesn't right. say he didn't. Uh, it, that's likely. I think your point is that maybe he didn't touch him. That that may be the case. But to me, there's two really, really important things that we learn from this conversation with Jesus and, and, and Thomas. Uh, and what, what two things really stand out to you, two ideas or concepts? Well, number one, Jesus says to him, touch me, handle me. He's saying, I'm physical. You can touch me and you can handle me. He's, he's, he's showing that he's physical, not a spirit. Yeah. Well, actually, I had two other things in mind, so I'm going to add your, your point to the three. Three very important things. One is the physical bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. Okay. And two would be it's uh, God places this great value on being being able to believe even though you haven't seen. Mm -hmm. See, uh, uh, Jackson, did you ever see Jesus in person? Definitely not. And frankly, anybody who claims they've had a vision like that, I'm incredibly uh, skeptical right off the bat, if not cynical towards, because you have a lot of false teaching out there under the guise of some experience they've had, or whether it be near death or vision or something, and they'll they'll contradict the Bible, they'll say eternal security is not true, or they'll say... They'll try to add yeah. works to salvation, and then they keep on going back to, well, I saw it, Jesus told me, and all that garbage. So we really need to be on the lookout for that whenever we're... Well, let's, let's, let's investigate this further, Jackson. You, you haven't seen Jesus personally. Uh, Austin, how about you? No. You haven't seen him either? No, not personally. How about, how, how about uh, Eric? You, have you seen him? No, I have not. Mitch, did you see him? He Yes, absolutely, I have. Okay. Absolutely, have seen Jesus. I've spoke with him. He calls his name Jesus. He used to be a gardener. He's an old guy, uh, and his name is Jesus. You didn't specify which Jesus we were speaking of. Yeah, you. Uh, this old man was a believer, and he always tells me about Christ. And uh, he's in his nineties, and yeah. his name is Jesus. You never and met maybe Jesus. Maybe that he actually is Jesus, I don't know it. But as far as I know, his name is Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Mitch first met uh, Jesus when he moved to San Diego because there's a lot of uh, uh, Hispanics living in, in San Diego. So now he's actually met Jesus. I've met, and it's spelled Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. So, so my, uh, Jackson, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, just I guess to harp on my point for one last time, there was actually a guy at my college campus, who's a, a street preacher guy, he was yelling at everyone, and one of the, his big arguments is he's been to heaven, so he knows his sinless perfection doctrine is true, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, well, Jackson, was he an obese guy? Yes. I I know who that is. I saw something about his uh, ministry. Not yeah, we're not going to even say his name right here, but... <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, and I'll tell you now, since I'm asking the question, I might as well answer it too. I, uh, I, I have yet to, to see Jesus, uh, personally see him. And yet, we all believe in Jesus. We believe that he, he is a real person. He really existed. The stories about Jesus in the, the Bible are true. He exists today, and he is God made flesh. We believe that. We're convinced of it. Uh, so my point is that Jesus is telling Thomas, oh, well, yeah, now that you've seen me, you believe. I mean, well, of course. But what I really respect in a person is someone who's going to believe in me even though they didn't see me. That's what I value. That's what Jesus is telling Thomas. Mm -hmm. So I think that Jesus values Eric and Jackson and the rest of us more than he valued Thomas because we didn't have to see him to believe in him, to put our trust and faith in him. 
Uh, and then uh, we've got uh, the other thing is uh, Thomas, how he reacts when he believes. What does he do? He calls him my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he worships him. Mm -hmm. So Jehovah Witnesses, this is an example of Jesus being worshipped, and Jesus did not, as Paul and Peter and others have done in Scripture, he didn't say, I'm just a man, don't worship me. Mm -hmm. No, Jesus right. did not say that. He accepted this worship and the title of my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay? So uh, to me, those are the three things that are really uh, of great value for us to learn from this interaction with Jesus and Thomas is there is a physical resurrection. There, uh, there, there is this uh, title of deity that Jesus accepts that He is God. Uh, and then, uh, what was the middle one? I forgot around. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, seeing. Even mm -hmm. though he, even though if you're watching this now, uh, you you won't get probably get to see Jesus until you get to heaven. But if you will believe in him in spite of not seeing him, that's what Jesus asked for. He asked you to put your faith in him even though you can't see him. You know what, what, what else, this, something else stands out to me here too in addition to those three points. And that's, you know how, Luke, you remember a while back you made a video called Believe Defined where people want to make up some other form of definition like a life of obedience or something like that. Uh-huh. It's interesting how nonsensical that is in this context of saying, blessed are those who believe but haven't seen. I mean, are you really going to say, blessed are those who commit their lives to me even though they don't see? Or is he talking about believing as in putting trust in, affirming is true? It's really, really the whole, that definition of zero sense here. Yeah. That's a good that's catch, a, Jackson. That's a good catch. Yeah. That's what I call a good get. Uh, Eric calls it a good catch. Yeah, it's a little... It's a little point that most people would not even notice. Aspie but, Wisdom. Yeah, Aspie Wisdom. <laughs> yeah. He, puts, he yeah. puts two and two together really, really well. <laughs> These that, things you know, have, have to be careful. You know, that yeah. verse has been in front of me for so long, and the, the, to use that in defense of believe only, trust in Jesus only, believe only, I, it's, it's just... In, in taking for granted the fact that I already know this, I've kind of gone over that and totally gone by it and missed the fact that he doesn't add anything to that. He just says, believe, that's it. Yeah, because like, like, like I've, told, I've told everyone that I come across people, and I, I don't mean just street preaching heretics, but a, a lot on my college campus, and we've met some on YouTube where they redefine the word believe to mean something it doesn't mean, like yeah. full surrender or something like that. Yes. Number one... They, they'll, oftentimes they'll say, oh, the Greek word means something else, which it doesn't. You can look it up in the Greek concordance and, and verify that. But not only, even if we didn't have that, look at how nonsensical their point is when, when Thomas says, blessed are those who, or sorry, Jesus says, Thomas, blessed are those who commit their whole lives to serving me, even though they haven't seen me. <laughs> right, exactly. Because <laughs> you think that'd be kind of important, don't you? I mean, well, you think he would say zero that. in the context, because the whole point is believing as opposed to not believing. There's well, you, nothing about you, you know the other. You know what the other thing you just said that brings to mind, and since we're on the belief issue here and talking about this, when they're seeing the risen Christ. I think people sell short what believing on Jesus Christ means, what trusting in Jesus Christ means. You're doing so many things by doing that. When you place your trust in Jesus Christ, it's not just a case of just, oh, I think there's, I think there's Jesus. No, when you, when you, when we're talking the belief that is to salvation, you're trusting completely. You're telling, you're not only saying I believe in Christ, I believe on Christ, but you're saying to God, I believe you. I believe what you have said. I believe what you have done. When you tell me this is the process I've taken, this is the steps I've taken on your behalf to save you, and this is the sacrifice I've provided for you, and you trust in Christ, you're saying, yes, I believe on Jesus, I trust on him, and at the same time you're saying, God, I believe you. I'm taking your word. I'm trusting in the word that you've given that this is, that Jesus was the sacrifice and is everything you said he is. Mm-hmm. And and uh, the next step of that, of course, is believing in his promise. Not only what he has done, but his promise of what he will do. He, right. he, he promises to give Eric eternal life in mm -hmm. this uh, new heaven and new earth, and that's a promise, and you believe him. You trust Absolutely. him to keep his promise. 
And like you said about the, about have I seen Jesus firsthand? No, I haven't. Um, have I received those things already? No, not yet. But when my redemption happens, my redemption comes, I have faith in Christ and his word and what he said, and I believe that what he said is true. Well, that's important um, belief. I'm just looking at my experience with being born again. And it happened when I was reading the scriptures, or I was halfway reading, I was praying. I asked God to help me to see something. I was asking, I was seeking, I was knocking. I wasn't believing at that point. I, I mean, I, to a certain degree I believed, but it didn't hit me the way it had hit me when I had asked the question, God, why should I, all these other ways of religions, why should I follow your way? And then I asked him to give me, to, to, to show me. And I opened up the Bible and looked down. I don't suggest people do this, but in this case, when I looked down, it said the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, a capstone, a stone that makes mm -hmm. men stumble and a rock that makes them fall. At that point, something happened to me. It was metaphysical. It wasn't from me. It was from outside me. It hit me in the head and impressed upon me, you have to believe. So what happened was, is that my, almost like on the road to the mass, my burning and my desire to know and to understand these things for, for the things I had read about Christ, but my questions were still on my mind. But then what happened was there was something, uh, something from without me that impressed upon me very clearly that Jesus Christ is, and I was convinced. And then when I started reading the scriptures, they all started making much more sense. I, it was like I could find Jesus on every page. So this is what I define as my defining moment of being born again. Because all the other times, even the time when I got to three pennies, I didn't have that kind of faith, although I always trusted. But what had happened was as a result of me asking, seeking, and knocking, and then in his proper time, he looked down and he said, believe. And... By his Holy Spirit, I saw. Yeah. I, I The thing that came to my mind as you're talking there is uh, there's this uh, old this song, uh, I've Seen the Light, this old hymn. It's, uh, I think what happened is at that moment, uh, you believed, you were convinced, you saw the light, and you were quickened. Uh, you were regenerated, born again, at the, even before you even realized it. At, at the moment you came to this conclusion, wow, then you're quickened right then. You didn't have to stop and say, wait, uh, do I need to say a prayer or something, or do I need to s s tell somebody, or uh, do I need to uh, uh, say something out loud? Or, no, it's at the moment that you saw the light, God quickened you. Maybe it's simultaneous. You see the light, you get quickened, boom. And uh, right. It was and, an epiphany from heaven. Yeah, yeah. So I just thank God that all of us on the panel, we all saw the light. Uh, what's that last one, uh, Eric, uh, this uh, interaction with Peter? Oh, uh, and Peter, which is also in the same book, so he doesn't bother to mention uh, John again. It's uh, a little further along, John 21, verses 15 through 22. Um, <clears throat> and that states, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, 
Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Something didn't make sense in that to me. Why, why did he ask about which is he that betrayeth thee? I thought he was, Peter was asking about John and his, his future. Uh, did, did I hear that correctly? It said, yeah, verse 20 says, uh, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which oh. also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, oh. Lord, oh, he, he just notices that, that John is following, he, the one Jesus loved. That's classically John, he's referring to John. Okay, um, but when you said betrayeth the, uh, he wasn't saying that John betrayed no, him. No, 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 no. No, he sort of... When, yeah, he when, sort of he sort of was uh, he sort of was like looking, noticed John following, and he kind of you get the impression he leaned in to ask, which is he that betrayeth thee? Yeah, <laughs> Peter uh -huh. seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, there's a there's a lot of interesting uh, things to learn from that uh, conversation with Peter and, and Jesus too. Uh, what what stands out? Well, I think you have the question about John's future, mm -hmm. Peter's future, Peter's attitude towards John, and and uh, and uh, you know, kind of a competition, competitive attitude, right. desiring right. A, desiring a certain uh, place or role, and, and then uh, uh, also um, uh, Peter's future, his 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 uh, his death, and John's future, uh, as far as would he die too or not? Right. You know, it was always funny, just as a side note, the, the part in Scripture where, um, I think it's in John, where they talk about where Peter and him were running to the tomb, and that he, he but he, he makes sure that he mentions that he got there first. I almost wonder if that was like sort of an inside ribbing that he was given to Peter when he wrote that, <laughs> as if, you know, as if to say, yeah, but I beat you, I got there first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in, in, in the, on all the Jesus movies, you know, John and Peter are portrayed physically different, you know, Peter is usually a... Like an older, more cumbersome type of guy, and and mm. John is like a younger, more athletic type of guy. So <laughs> maybe that's why they, that's why they they uh, cast them in that way. Funny how it's worded, because this says Simon, son of John. Do you love me? Now Simon uh, means he hears, or one that hears. It would be Peter, but it says Simon, son of John. He hears, uh, or he hears, son of love. Do you love me? Or I would say, he who hears, son of love, do you love me? I'm just looking at the play of words. Uh, the name John means love or love, and Simon means one who hears. Mm -hmm. And just looking at the words, it's just uh, interesting to me. I'm yeah, the, 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 it, it is really uncanny how the, the characters in the Bible, their names all have a definition or a meaning that actually describes them perfectly. It's just amazing. Uh, so did they get the name and then that's then they became that kind of person, or were they that kind of person and thus they were named that, they called that later? I, it's just amazing. It's it's really like a miraculous thing that the names fit them so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it, you can talk about labeling theory, which is the idea that. If you label someone something, they're more likely to act like you. But I kind of think they took on the na the meaning because of those people, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. But what I also got out of that is I, I, I don't know what translation you read, but off the top of my head, I, I think he's called Simon Barjona, mm -hmm. which Barjona means son of Jonah, or of Jonah, I guess right. John would Right, it's son of John, Jonah. Um, right. It's like Johannes, jo Jonah, they're like kind of the same name. So. Yeah. Yeah, and now, and of course, instead of Bar Jonah, or uh, uh, you got uh, uh, Bar, uh, what was Paul's uh, Barbarus? Uh, Barnabas. 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 That means son of encouragement. So this Bar in front of the name son of, and then we got like we do it in English backwards. We put John's son, the son of John. Right. Well, bar thing. would be Aramaic, yes. Ben is Ben is actually Hebrew. I think bar is Aramaic. 
Yeah, bar and ben both prefixes mean son. I don't know which is Aramaic and Hebrew well, or not. I can tell you for sure, ben is, is, is Hebrew for son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see you. Okay, so it says, uh, uh, you will see how similar they are to his interaction with these same people before he died. In other words, Randy Alcorn, in these three examples, is trying to make us understand that the way Jesus interacted with all these people before his death, he re interacted in the same way after the death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are we to conclude then that in eternity Jesus is going to be reacting with all of us in the same kind of a way? Can we expect these kinds of friendship and relationships and dialogues with Jesus? I look forward to them. Yeah. It says, we will experience continuity between our current lives and our resurrected lives with the same memories and relational histories. Okay, so Randy's trying to make the comparison that uh, just as the apostles had this continuity with Jesus before before uh, his death and after and in the resurrection, the, the same kind of continuity existed. And, and we, when we go into eternity, we'll still have the same kind of continuity in terms of our, our memories, our experiences, our relationships, our friendships, uh, family, perhaps. Oh, I man, think... That's uh, pretty cool. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking of something along the lines of the Matrix where, like, Jesus could be anybody. Yeah. Like an agent, you know? Hey, you guys, you think you, when we get in eternity, you guys will still be interested in hanging out with me sometimes? Of course. Uh, maybe, I don't know. No, I'll be too busy. <laughs> no way. Oh, man. man, they bleed right off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll I know that you're, you're, I'm going to be too busy. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to meet a lot of really interesting people, so I don't know well, if you have apparently, any with, with all the with all the stalkers you have, apparently you're one of the very interesting people. <laughs> I must be very fascinating. Person. Like, like when I watched your video on the obsessive delusional stalkers, I just couldn't stop laughing all the way through. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention briefly, since we're on our live thing too, people got to catch your video you just did, which was also outstanding, real quick, which was your about your two seconds. I thought that was excellent. I was glad you put that on after we talked. So I was glad. Oh, yeah. I was glad you put that. I, on. I wonder, Luke, if in eternity the same people will be your obsessive delusional stalkers. <laughs> Well, if if these stalkers are saved, and of course you, you, we don't know who's saved and who's not. Right, right. Uh, I I don't go by a person's uh, lifestyle or anything else to determine it. I, I go by just uh, their statement of faith. If they profess that their faith is in Jesus, not in themselves, not in their own ability, only on Jesus, then I I have to take them at that, and I'll accept it. But but some people will say the right thing. And yet, I, maybe they're not saved, uh, so I won't see them in heaven. But if some of these stalkers and obsessive people are saved, and, then um, I'm sure that we'll have a nice, wonderful relationship, yeah. and they'll probably they'll probably really love to hang out with me a lot. <laughs> maybe I'll go to an it island. It would somewhere. be heaven for them if they couldn't stalk you. Apparently, so that's all they spend their time doing. <laughs> Well, I'm, sure that, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people saying, uh, I'm sorry to each other. <laughs> about well, that's what I was little, thinking about. Like, like what Will happened to Wilson? Will. Right, exactly. I, like, I'll be put on an island somewhere. And I'll have to deal with Wilson on some <laughs> castaway island. <laughs> Okay, but we'll have to like, that's you know, a serious, hang out together and like that, that's maybe later what? later in our study though cuz when you say people there'll be people apologizing I've actually wondered if that'll actually happen if people well, will apologize I mean I, I mean as, as far as the thing it's like, like you know, on a wait, serious level I, Oh sure absolutely I mean as far as like I, I think there we'll get together to say I mean like we talked about you will have memories of our life we'll know things and I, I think you know if, if I would love I would love for that to be the case for brothers who disagreed on things to come to together in heaven and say, wow, you know, well, now we have all the answers to the questions, you know, so there, there, there's no there's no denying this is the case, you know, sorry about that, brother, you know, we make peace with each other and, and, we, and we go on through eternity as, uh, you know. I just don't want to have to say, boy, I was stupid. No, that, that's a, that'll be an interesting topic well, I, later for for discussion. Those will there be apologies in heaven? That's I something think, I, I, I think so. I think so. There's not there's nothing negative about an apology. It's a positive thing. I think there'll be I think there'll be a lot of peacemaking in heaven. I think there'll be a lot of um, 
a lot of resolution to things in heaven. I mean, really, ultimately, really, isn't that what heaven's all about? Well, you know, it's about it's, restoring it's, friendships, relationships. I think it's much more likely that everybody who disagrees with me never gets to go to heaven. <laughs> so in other words, you preach, you preach the dogmatist gospel that I made the <laughs> video. Oh, no. I can hear it now, Luke. Here we go. It's the next video. Luke declares us all unfit to go to heaven. Here we go. It's just open so another key. taking that out of con that joke out of context. Exactly. Yeah. Kick okay, the hornet's Jackson, nest. Jackson, Jackson, uh, you did know this. That was a joke. So uh, he, uh, he got that. He got that one. That, one. that, was <laughs> that one I did care. You, 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 you did catch the one that. about the lobotomy I did on that one, right? You have to be lobotomized. In lobotomized. Order to... Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, shoot. Yeah. So he says, uh, <clears throat> once we understand that Christ's resurrection is the prototype for the resurrection of mankind and the earth, we realize that Scripture has given us an interpretive precedent for approaching passages concerning human resurrection and life on the new earth. Shouldn't we interpret passages alluding to resurrected people living on the new earth as literally as those concerning Christ's resurrected life during the 40 days he walked on the old earth? That's the question. Is it, uh, are we going to take these, uh, uh, the scriptures that talk about Jesus in his resurrected state between his resurrection and his ascension, there's 40 days, we take those things literally I think most of most uh, of uh, we all do. Most people who study the scriptures and, and uh, believe the scriptures and are Christians do take it literally. There, there's a liberal uh, group of people like that Jesus seminar group that we were talking about last time that uh, they want to uh, allegorize everything and and not take it literally. But we, if we take this literally, then why should we not? Take the take it literally that uh, we too in our resurrected bodies are going to have these same kind of body and, and kind of uh, experience and life that Jesus had for the forty days. Well, I think I think there's no reason not to, but we should also be be clear that there's something mysterious about these resurrected bodies that I think we won't be able to fully piece together until we get them. Like remember my comment at the beginning of the study about the mystery, because I don't think. They won't be physical in the sense of them that they won't be decaying and stuff, but they'll be tangible. It's hard to know how that would even work together scientifically. So I think that that's kind of part of the surprise. I think it's it's very important to consistently apply this conservative approach that we take to scripture to the whole thing, because otherwise you could get into who knows what kind of false doctrine and even stuff like like believe doesn't actually mean believe like we covered earlier in this show and everything so I, I think that as long as we're being consistent we're okay. Uh, let me ask this uh, so that I know how to pace ourselves here for the two-hour show. Uh, we didn't start on the normal time. I'm not, I don't recall exactly how, does anybody know how long we've been on right now on the live show? About an hour and 15 minutes, something like oh. that. Well, an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so now uh, he says, uh, the promise of imperishable bodies. When Paul speaks of our resurrection bodies, he says, quote, the body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body." Unquote. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44. So, uh, that's quite a contrast, point by point. Let's go one at a time. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. What's that mean? Perishable. It well, it's what last. It, exactly. It was it, perishable. Perishable means it doesn't last. It's what Jackson was just talking about, as far as you know, no decay you know, to a to an imperishable body, which is no decay. It can't die. Mm -hmm. Yes, perishable. Uh, uh, corruptible is another word too. Mm -hmm. Incorruption and corruptible. Uh, 
there's a verse that talks about how Jesus uh, would not suffer corruption in the grave. In other words, his body would not rate, uh, rot and, and, and uh, decay in the grave. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, our bodies are imperishable, our glorified bodies. Uh, they will never wear out and never be, need to be discarded again. Uh, it says, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. I think okay. that yeah, the, the the dishonor right there speaks to the you know the curse of sin, um, sown in sin. It's it it thereby unfortunately through being born as a human being, you're you're born in a dishonored state. Well, Adam's fall, you know, Adam and Eve when they fell after eating the fruit, their, their bodies would die. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, definitely um, you know, and and now the, the the correction of course is Christ. So it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, honor is an interesting word. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'd like to be an honorable person. Uh, I, you know, and if I'm going to be on, honest or honorable, though, I know that in my life I haven't always been honorable. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are things in my life that there's no honor. There's only just like shame and regret. Uh, but. I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to that time when I, my life can be completely honorable without any dishonor, any any shame and regret for for uh, you know my thoughts and deeds. Then we got the contrast. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. I really like this one. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. You're like Mighty Mouse or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you go from, you know, you fall, you skin your knees, you break bones, you get sick, you get fatigued, you get, you know, you, you're, we're, we're weak by our nature to a body that knows none of those things. I mean, that's that's pretty incredible prospect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we Mitch mentioned Mighty Mouse. Uh, I mentioned Batman earlier. Uh, I think last show I talked about this this ra uh, raising power. I used the example of like Superman able to leap a, a, a tall, tall building. building with a single bound. Yeah. This amazing and, stranger from the planet Krypton, Man of Steel, <laughs> Superman. I had to finish the intro. <laughs> so, so uh, it's the idea of of uh, power raised. Uh, let me see. Raised uh, in power. I mean, I like the idea of having these great powers that we're we're uh, con is conjecture. You know, will we be able to just material ourselves, uh, materialize ourselves into a room? Will be a, will we be able to think ourselves uh, and and be in a different location in the country or on Earth, or maybe even another uh, planet? Uh, will will we be able to? Uh, uh, change our appearance and do these shapeshifter type things and who knows what else but it's going to be power and power I'm, I'm think is far more power than than we've ever had in, in our mortal mortal lives mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be like X-Men, you know X-Men? Yeah. <laughs> yeah The only problem I see is there's no enemies to fight it seems like <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll be like teams. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be like tag. Maybe, no, maybe we'll do some our fair share of LARPing in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> like you know, like, like like paintball or whatnot. We'll have like, oh, it'd be so cool. All these like, yeah. like, like ah, yeah, you're done. You know, I don't know. Yeah. That'd be fun. We 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 have, we have an have an ASD only team maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. Actually, Extra superpowers that we have to ASD people. Be very careful. Uh, and then the final comparison is: it is sown a natural body; uh, it is raised a spiritual body. We talked about this earlier, and a lot of people get, I think, misunderstand what a spiritual body is. It it, it doesn't say spirit body. Uh, matter of fact, if there was even a uh, not a physical body. Why doesn't it just say spirit? In other words, you're 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 sown with a body and you're raised with a spirit. 
Yeah. I think the term I think to use the term spirit body would be an oxymoron. A spirit doesn't have a body, so you, you'd be using two terms that don't really go together. Spirits don't have bodies. By definition, yeah. they don't have bodies. So, so the <laughs> word spiritual, spiritual is an adjective to describe the type of body. Yeah. So we have a physical body, but it's a spiritual. Whereas right now, our bodies are um, what what are words to describe our body now? Uh, physical. Uh, yeah, physical, the flesh, with the sin nature. We won't have the sin nature. We'll just have spiritual attributes with our bodies. Well, our spirits are in our bodies, too. I mean, we'll be reunited with our bodies. I think television, though, like Casper the Friendly Ghost or some, or, or you know what I mean? Like you're floating around, you look like a white sheet. Television mm -hmm. and, and media and even before that, the way it's always been thought of in books has always been existential. And has, I think it's really most people look at spirit as spirit, and when we're dead, we're able to, like, you know, uh, if things go through us, we're able to walk through things, so we don't have a, a tangible, uh, mm -hmm. what would be, or, or semi tangible, or halfway invisible body. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's another thing there. You know, maybe, maybe spiritual refers more to um, our capabilities rather than a state. You know, it's a, it's it's you know it's it's not saying a spirit body. It's saying a spiritual body, as in you know there are other things that it's spiritual. There are other spiritual beings, which are angels, for instance, are spiritual beings. Um, maybe it's speaking more to our capabilities by that term than it is towards a physicality. Well, Jesus was raised in his in his spiritual body, and he mm -hmm. ate, he ate he ate and he and he and he had he touched people and he. He was around people, so and, and yeah. yet it had capabilities far beyond what his what his previous body had. So it was. It was... I would think that the spiritual body, uh, um, the sig significance to me, is, is this sin nature. Because I know that when I was uh, when I believed in Jesus, uh, the Bible says I was quickened, my spirit, and Jesus said that I was born again, but not not born from my mother's womb a second time. I was born from above. And to me, what happens with your, when you put your faith in Jesus, you get born again, You are uh, your spirit is quickened. Your spirit, your dead spirit is brought to life. Mm -hmm. And there's a connection. See, I, I think that the connection man originally had with God, like this, uh, was severed at the mm -hmm. fall. And then when I put my faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit and my spirit are connected again. And uh, so now my spirit is is fine. My spirit's healthy, alive, mm -hmm. and, uh, united with God. But my body's still the issue. My body, something in every cell of my body, something in, in my genetic code makes me a sinner. Uh, it's that sin nature. And I still have to deal with that. And uh, once I get my new body, this spiritual body, it doesn't have that old sin nature anymore. So I don't have these, as Jackson was asking before, you know, about temptations. In the last episode, he says, uh, we're going to have temptations in eternity. And I said, well, who's there to tempt you? I mean, you're only going to have, you know, uh, you know, glorified people. You don't have uh, the bad people. You don't have the devil there. So there's nobody to tempt you. And you don't have to deal with that old carnal body with that sin nature anymore. So what's, where's the temptation? Mm -hmm. So did Adam and Eve have a, have a spiritual body to begin with? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think before the fall they did. That's what happened, is that the spirit was severed, and somehow something happened in the genetic code right there, that just like a disease. I look at the fall of man as man beginning like a, 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 getting a disease, and it's a genetic disease that's passed on to all the offspring. We're all born with a birth defect, the sin nature. Because God had breathed the spirit into the man. Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, and so that was the breath of life. And then we, man, had eaten of the fruit, mm -hmm. which didn't completely sever the spirit because he still breathed afterwards, but actually was spiritually dead after they, they ate of the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've compared it in other, uh, other videos. Uh, I've talked about how... Um, you, you have this uh, man's spirit, the breath of God in, in man, and, uh, and, and then you have the fall and it's severed. It's like an umbilical cord that's cut. 
and now there's this separation. You're no longer connected. And it's almost like uh, being plugged into a, a wall outlet and we were plugged into God, we we're connected, but now we're unplugged and we don't have the energy, the source, uh, the spiritual energy from the Holy Spirit any longer. Or, or an internet connection where you lose the connection and we need to get reconnected so we're back to have this uh, connection. We do it through the Spirit. Our spirit gets regenerated, quickened, uh, uh, connected to the Holy Spirit. Um, so I, I think the spirit with, and the body of, of Adam and Eve was perfect, and, and then the fall, what happened is their spirit got disconnected, and their body became uh, corruptible, perishable, and we all inherited that. And we all have, uh, we all, we're all born with these dead spirits that need to be reconnected through the new birth, and, and, and then once we do that, the spirit problem solved, the body problem solved, only gets solved in the resurrection. Austin, what do you think of that? I thought he might not be there. He's in the spirit. <laughs> he might have got raptured, man. No, he just got back. Oh, okay. I thought maybe we were left behind and he got raptured away. <laughs> he was going no, up no. seven times. I, I, I turned my mic on mute. I was still here, though. Oh, okay. All right. Sometimes I'm going to surprise you guys who, who have the icons up because I can't see you there. I'll, <laughs> I'll be testing. Um, so Randy talks about this spiritual body uh, as we've been discussing he said when Paul uses the term spiritual body in 1st Corinthians he is not talking about a body made of spirit or an incorporeal body there's no such thing body means corporal that's flesh and bones the word spiritual here is an adjective describing body not negating its meaning a spiritual body is first and foremost a real body or it would not qualify to be called a body. Paul could have simply said, quote, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spirit, unquote. If that were the case, judging from Christ's resurrection body, a spiritual body appears most of the time to look and act like a regular physical body, with the exception that it may have, and in Christ's case it does have, some powers of a metaphysical nature that is beyond normal physical abilities. Hmm. So, we talked about his uh, extra abilities. Obviously, when Jesus was resurrected, he demonstrated some of these abilities. Uh, I think he had far more abilities. I think he probably could have done anything at that point. I mean, you know, before before his, his death on the cross, uh, even though he was God, uh, manifest in the flesh, it says that he set aside some of his power <coughs> temporarily so that he could be, live as a man. And uh, at the resurrection, do you think those powers were still set aside, or or was he just capable of just doing anything if he wanted to the, after the resurrection? Very weird because my head goes in a lot of different directions. I got this Toby, what's his name, uh, Spider-Man in my mind, and I'm wondering if, like, you know how you have zip lines and whatnot that we go to parks? I'm wondering if I'll actually be able to get an attachment or be able to just shoot webs and, like, swing between buildings. Or, I'm mm -hmm. just, I, I don't know why my head is going there, but I think it would be awfully fun to do the Spider-Man. Yeah. You know, Mitch, that's a very bizarre idea. But it's a, it's a, it's an. I'm open to hearing that idea. I like these. You can kinds go of, with me, man. We, you know, forget about like, parachuting. Like we'll grab airplanes and we'll swing under them and then grab buildings. <laughs> and, oh man, I, I mean, I mean, flying's fun, but swinging, oh, like yeah, oh, God, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe there's no limit to our, except our imagination. The things that we'll <laughs> oh, do for, man. We have, like, uh, for entertainment. Tech. See that? We'll have teams. I'll be on the Aspie team, man. Yeah, yeah. That'll be, we'll be the, the best team, team ever. Mitch? Yeah. Mitch, what do you what do you say the name of your team is? Aspie, the A team. The A team. <laughs> oh, the Aspie the team. team. What, you know, are you gonna are you gonna only hang out with Aspies? <laughs> Mitch, are you gonna are you gonna discriminate and only hang out with Aspies in eternity? It's possible. Oh no, we can, we can we we support neurodiversity. Remember. <laughs> <laughs>
It's just that that'll be our team. Okay. I did have a question about that. What about modern technology? Do we have airplanes and cell phones and stuff like that, or would it be not needed? I would say we have more technology. They have chariots. Before we had airplanes, we had chariots that brought people up to heaven. I mean, that's well, pretty I broad. actually, I think, Austin, that um, there'll be a really, like, I, at least this is just a thought. I don't have anything to back this up, so we can look at this later, but you'll notice some, like, types of fantasy, like, particularly, like, like the Final Fantasy series of games, where they've got a really cool mixture of old-time things, like chariots and swords and that kind of older stuff with newer things like airplanes and stuff. And I've always thought maybe heaven could be like that, you know, like a futuristic medieval with technologies and stuff like that. Because oh, I yeah. actually picture kind of a medieval theme sort of in heaven because it's the kingdom of God. Well, you know, I, I think uh, Austin raised a really interesting question because yeah. it, it actually promotes some um, – some interesting ideas on the other side of that, which is, you know, we, we use you know, cell phones, of course, are like the, the biggest thing nowadays. People can't walk around without texting on their cell phone or something. But in heaven, I kind of always uh, kind of got the impression that maybe we won't need that at all. It may be a sense of if I want to communicate with somebody, all I need to do is simply think to that person. That person can think back to me. Is there, or, or will we be unlimited by that capacity to just, uh, you know, if I want to be in the presence of something, can I just be in the presence of someone in a thought, you know, it, uh, from one end of the universe to the other? Um, can I have thought waiting? Huh? Thought waiting? <laughs> <laughs> or thought blocking, or thought blocking, or you can. I don't feel like talking to you right now. Because yeah, it's like you can't really pull that in heaven, can you? Because it's like you, in eternity you can't pull. It's like man, I can't ignore them. Like uh, I gotta take this. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cena, Hold that Austin, thought. Austin, that was a that was a very good question. It was a good question. And and and, and that question, and a hundred others like it, are worth discussing. You know, trying to you know speculate and, and and is there anything in scripture that can give us any clues about it? Uh, some of the things we we're going to be left yeah. wanting. What? What's was the name? Was that Austin? No, no, no that dog is mine in the background. What kind of a dog is it? It's a Papillon. Is he neurotypical or not? Well, she's a, a dog. butterfly. Here, you want, you want, you want, you want me to show her? I'll get her. Yeah, let's see your dog. Well, you, you and that brings another you question. Can't a dog a butterfly. Jackson? A butterfly in front. Oh, all right, let's see. He's giving the dog a complex. The dog thinks it's a butterfly. <laughs> he wants to be a butterfly. He wants to fly. I'm a butterfly. Pass this is my on. sister's dog. So. Was your other question, were animals going to be in heaven? Well, that's the next question I'm going to ask once we see this dog. Yeah, see her. I no, like how ja Jackson, real quick, I like how you were like, this is my sister's dog. Is yeah. like, I don't want to claim any responsibility for what this animal no, looks like. Jackson, you realize, Jackson, you don't have your video on. You just have your icon up. I there don't. Is. Yeah, there, okay. There, let's see the oh. dog. There. Oh, how cute. That's a pet. Uh, uh -huh. That's a pet. Now, the yeah, question the is, unfortunately, I wish we could, like, get the vocal cords removed on this dog <laughs> or something because it's it's – a uh, screech gives me a sensory overload. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah. I don't know why we ever got dogs. They drive me crazy. My yeah. uh, my other dog, my bigger, the big dog that I used to have, was um didn't do that at all. But uh, this well, one. Well, you know those uh, those shock shock collars work really well. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, my my wife made. Things my, my sister's very opposed to any discipline for this dog, pretty much. Which is well, why the shock collar is is good because my wife made yeah. me wear one, and, and uh, uh, you learn very quickly. Only a couple of times, and you learn not to talk, so that dog will learn very quickly. Yeah, but they, so here's the question: um, Do all dogs go to heaven, or just the little cute dogs like this one? Well, if there's one dog that does not deserve to go to heaven, it's this one. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 as as he pets as he pets the dog very very yeah. very lovingly and <laughs> yeah, trust me though this dog is like it has separation anxiety to the core. <laughs> He's yeah. a ham bone too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we we actually have a chapter coming up uh, on that Austin talking about our pets. Will <laughs> pets go to heaven? No, no, I, that that's a really good talk. Cause I love snakes. I love it if there were snakes in heaven and everything. So. 
Well, isn't it in the Bible that talks about the boy playing by the snake's hole? Or you, know what hap- yeah. you know what happened last time when the snake started interacting with us? <laughs> okay, so he says, Paul goes on to say, quote, And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful mm-hmm. part of the scriptures there? Yes. First Corinthians chapter 15. It's like, it's like, it's like mocking death. It's 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 a great line. Yeah, he's like uh, Paul's like laughing in the face of yeah, death. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he said when Paul says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he's referring to our flesh and blood as they are now, cursed and under sin. Our present bodies are fallen and destructible, but our future bodies, though still bodies in the fullest sense will be untouched by sin and indestructibility and indestructible. They will be like Christ's uh, resurrection body, both physical and indestructible. Now here's an interesting point. Uh, It says flesh and blood cannot enter, and it says that Jesus referred to himself as flesh and bone. And there are people, uh, including Dr. Ruckman, I, I brought this up too before, and if you remember a, little, a couple of sessions back, I yeah. kind of mentioned this. Yeah, I remember. I don't know where you got it from. Did you just think of it? or? Is no, it, I just thought of it myself. I never heard anybody really talk about it before. Yeah, Dr. Ruckman even says at the rapture, let's say you get raptured right now, <laughs> your body's taken away, but all the blood is left on the floor. You don't <laughs> take any blood with you. you know, all the blood's left behind. Uh, just like Jesus on the cross, all his blood was shed. No blood left. And there's, you know, this is the example he's saying. Blood can't enter the kingdom of God in eternity, but flesh and bones can, as Jesus said. So uh, now, now Randy Alcorn takes another uh, perspective on this. He's saying that, yeah, flesh and blood in our current state, but flesh and blood in a in a in a resurrected body with no sin nature can enter the kingdom of God. So, so the the question is, is Ruckman right, where we won't have any blood? In our bodies in eternity. Maybe what are we going to have? Like uh, maybe some kind of like uh, put, uh, uh, what's it you put in your radiator? Uh, antifreeze. <laughs> it, maybe well, we'll just have a body filled with antifreeze but, instead. But, but the, but is the it same water? Time, well, I it, well okay. As that's Christ a good. said, as I will bring forth the spring for you, and it will spring forth living water. Is it just water? Because water already takes up a large chunk of our body as it is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. For instance, I'm I'm glad Austin said that. That's a great that's a great point, Austin. Because when you consider the amount of water in our bodies as it is, why do we assume that we need it at all? We can't die. We can't bleed to death. We can't. We, we, so we, to assume that we need blood or need something to replace blood doesn't. We don't have to. We don't need it. We don't need to have it. Um, I, I want think it's it. an interesting take. <laughs> I want blood in heaven. I, I want my eyes in heaven. I, I don't really want to be changed too much from what I am. You know, I, I kind of, you know, everybody else doesn't have any blood. I mean, give me some blood. I'll just drink a lot of wine or something. <laughs> he doesn't want to wind up being anemic. <laughs> oh, my blood. I want my body. I, I, don't want, I don't want God to mess with my body. Okay, I want him to resurrect it. I want it to be better. But I don't want to but that's, okay, but wait a minute. But what if no blood is better? See, that's the whole thing. What what if what if we're limited by that by blood? What, what if what if when we lose that and we're even better, you know, it's it's even better state. So it's like well, what, if, I mean, what if we just made blood like raspberry jelly, you know? <laughs> I, don't, I mean what if? What if? What if? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever it is, I'll take it. But you know, I just kind of just wanna I, I, I definitely want something to make my, my body plump. You know, not fat, but you know, plump. You know, not like 
you know, like you're sucked in uh, bone and skin. And that doesn't mean you'll be that way. I mean, it just, you know. It's... Uh, maybe some sort of gelatin. I don't know. Well, he doesn't say blood and raspberry jelly can't help it here in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I'll go on. It says, a body, a body need not be destructible in order to be real. Our destructibility is an aberration from God's created norm. Death, disease, and deterioration of, of age are the products of sin. Because there was no death before the fall, presumably Adam and Eve's original bodies were either indestructible or self-repairing, perhaps healed by the tree of life, as suggested in Revelation 22.2. Yet they were truly flesh and blood. Hmm. Well, there's there's another interesting thing there, just to point out, and I'm not saying this is I'm not saying this is definite, but I'm saying notice when Christ comes back, we it's, I'm I'm glad we talked about the Thomas account. He insinuates to Thomas that Thomas could have put his fingers into his hands and literally into his side. Yet Jesus wasn't bleeding all over the place. He wasn't. There was nothing coming from the wounds. So, and we and we know the wound to his side went straight to the heart. I mean, it was straight to the through his lungs and into his heart. Yet there's no blood. So. I like that point. Very good get. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, what I was going to say about this indestructibility is that uh, um, uh, obviously Jesus could have like repaired his body and had no wounds left if he wanted to, right? But he he left that there as a sign to show, look, you know, I've, this is what I <coughs> this is how I suffered for you, and and. Uh, but, but he could very easily could have then, or maybe he has since, I don't know, uh, repaired all that and doesn't have any wounds remaining. But uh, we know as human beings, when we get an injury, our body heals itself. And let's say that you've got a, a cut, a laceration on your hand. I've got a little mark here on my hand right now. Can you see that little mark right there? A little higher. A little yeah, higher. I, I oh, skin, I can beat that. Hold on a I second. Skin. Look at this sucker. <laughs> I skinned my knuckle, and it's been really a couple of weeks, and it's healing, you know. So when you get a little uh, injury to your body, it may take uh, several days or several weeks or longer for it to heal and repair itself. But but see, what's to, what's to prevent this healing process from speeding up so that if we get, like, hurt in eternity or something, it just, like, heals it. You've seen these things speeded up like... Uh, in sci-fi movies, where if someone's wounded and you see the healing happening in a matter of a few seconds, I th I don't I don't see any reason why that couldn't be uh, uh, our our state in eternity. And maybe even with medical science, maybe people will be able to have very very quick healing like that uh, through scientific technology in the near future too. So, would we need to heal at all though? Um. You mean in eternity? Yeah, like I can't imagine skinning my knee in heaven. Yeah, I, I tend to believe we, we can't be wounded. I mean, yeah, because, maybe not. I mean, because yeah. you you kind of get the impression that pain would come along with a wound, and there be we know there's not going to be any pain. So I yeah. kind of like the idea of getting wounded in heaven, as long as it doesn't hurt too much. <laughs> as long as it doesn't. You know, like I could like like get like like run in the walls and get hit by trains and whatnot, uh. stand back up. I mean. <laughs> I also wonder if it's Christ's blood that will be in us instead of our own, because the life of the body is the blood, and if Christ's blood is in us, then it would be what would be running through our veins. Another interesting point. You guys, you guys are brilliant. The, the whole points you come up with here. Now, I'm not saying your points are 100% right, uh, but they're certainly very interesting things to consider, and uh, uh, that's one of the things I enjoy about our hangouts is that. Uh, uh, even Joe Byron, uh, he, he has some very weird ideas he's introduced into our discussions, but I I'll always find those topics interesting and worth discussing, you know, and uh, uh, so I, I'm glad that uh, we have this, this kind of freedom, and uh, not only to bring up the subject, but to know that you're not, we're not, no one's going to get re ridiculed or shunned just because you have some unusual idea, you know. Uh, let's let's uh, take the last ten minutes here to just kind of summarize our thoughts on this and, and make con conclusions. 
And we'll pick up uh, next time with uh, chapter 12. Um, Austin, uh, did, did anything really uh, surprise you in the discussion today or any uh, anything stand out as really significant? Just the new uh, the new body's pretty unique in its home. Like it's it'll be interesting to see what it's like. And uh, mm -hmm. I like the idea with the blood thing. I'm I like the idea of it be water. That be seems pretty cool. But I also like the idea that you know blood's a significant thing that bought us. So I'm I'm good with either or on that. So I'm I'm fine with that. But I uh I like the new body thing. It's pretty unique that it won't get sick or die. Or, you know you can't have anything wrong with it or any disabilities or sicknesses. That's that's a unique thing. That's a unique thing so. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, uh everybody who's uh, if if you're young and very healthy, you know you don't appreciate as much as someone like. There's a, another person in the book. I didn't cover this part, but Johnny Erickson Tata is a Christian uh, writer and stuff. She's paralyzed from the like the neck down, I think, and. And she talks about how she's looking forward to that glorified body that's going to be perfect again, you know. And and you you get people like me. I I got spinal stenosis, and during half the show, my legs have gone completely numb, and and uh, you know my body's aching, and I I I'm really very very anxious for uh, for this new body with uh, no more pain or aches, and and uh, just with some kind of Superman extra powers that we don't have now. So it's really Really exciting, but uh, maybe if you're young and feeling invincible and you're really healthy, and you know, maybe it doesn't it doesn't mean as much to you. I don't know. Uh, how about uh, I responded to that, uh, Brother Jackson? Since you're the one of the young guys, I respond to what exactly? The point I just made about uh, is it more uh, exciting for someone like me to think of having this healthy, glorified body. Oh, right, right, right. And, and someone like you, who's young and healthy and very vibrant. Well, see, I don't know. I think there, there are uh, two sides of that coin, like I mentioned earlier. Like, I think I, I wasn't intending to be funny, but I think there also is a positive aspect of aging too. Like, I look forward to kind of a mind with more wisdom and stuff. So I think kind of a best of both worlds experience will probably be gained in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And uh, our brother Eric, what, what, anything stand out to you as surprising or really significant? You know, I always was of the thought that, you know, when Jesus Christ says, I'd, I go to prepare a place for you, we should all kind of go, wow. I mean, because nobody prepares a place like Jesus prepares a place. I mean, so, I mean, we can't even come close to a fraction of a shred of what he can possibly achieve. So it should make people just with with awe wonder, like the ultimate Christmas morning. I mean, what awaits us? And, and to think, and th you know, we're, we're talking about just one aspect right now, just your body. This is the first thing you're going to get. You know, the rapture happens. You receive our resurrected bodies. You get your resurrected body. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. And we're already having this huge conversation about an eternity's worth of what we'll do with these bodies. And that, to me, is just staggering. That's just that one aspect of eternity, your person, the person of you. And that, to me, is just really humbling. I mean, when you think of it in the scope of eternity and go to the next step, like you mentioned animals or whatever or, or, or natural things. You know, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just it's very humbling to think about. Mm -hmm. It's humbling as, 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 as you were talking, I was contemplating the universe too. When you think of the, the scope of creation, the vastness mm -hmm. of it, and, uh, and then how significant we are, uh, it, it, we seem to be so tiny, you know, out of, it, it, just a speck out of all creation, and yet we're so significant, significant to uh, our Creator God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Br Brother Mitch, what do you got to say? Well, there won't be any fun in heaven. <laughs> we'll be like, you know, those cherubim that go around saying, holy, holy, that's all we'll do. We'll just be there to serve God and, and be some sort of drone that just kind of does. And some, somehow going in circles serves him really well, too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is what you'll be doing in heaven for all eternity. Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this fun? I think not. 
I think there'll be amusement parks in heaven. I think, you know, and I don't know. But I don't think that, that heaven, I think people get this idea that heaven is just this place where you're given new bodies, everything's going to be great, but you're going to be serving all the time. You'll be at his feet. Because you're used to serving and repenting before God and, and having this servitude where we're all oh, holy, holy, worthy, worthy, holy. This is what we're doing. Our eternity is praising your face. After a while, you know, after a million or two years of looking at Jesus' face and only his face, I don't know if I could handle that. But, you know, I don't mean to be irreverent, but I really don't think that's when he, he ate fish with them. He laughed with them. He, he, Jesus did tell jokes. I mean, I really, I really think that people's vision for heaven is something hideous compared to a new heaven and new earth where we can go and buy food without any money. That means we're going to bring it home and enjoy it and maybe have a party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you don't need the mark of the beast to buy it either. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A very key point. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, really, uh, Mitch, you, you've gone back uh, ten episodes to the very beginning when we were making this point that the there are so many people, even, including Christians, who are not excited about heaven because they have this perception that it's just going to be nothing but just like, you know, praying and worship, worshiping, and it's, it sounds to to most Christians it sounds like just a boring, laborious eternity that that they really have no interest in, and and that's why this kind of study is so important. Uh, I hope that a lot of people watch this series. We'll probably have this is the tenth one. We'll probably have about. Uh, I'm guessing probably about another uh, 30, I have a total of 30 of them or so. So it's going to be about 60 hours about heaven. And, and there's a lot. Uh, it, I, I hope that we're not the only ones that enjoy this discussion. I hope people watch this and benefit uh, from this because uh, it will really get you excited about the future and it, when you understand the reality of what the Bible says of our future uh, rather than what the world as a whole sees sees the future of the, of the afterlife, whether it's Christian or anything else. It seems like everybody's perception of the afterlife is just really not very fun, as Mitch says. But what well, we know the Bible, uh, if we study the Bible and learn about our eternal, our future, is that, that it's going to be fun. It's going to be joy. It's going to be just thrilling. So uh, I would say that um, if, if someone's watching this video, and, and now you're getting to be excited about heaven, if you, and you want to have this this uh, glorified body. You're going to want to get resurrected from the grave and have a glorified body that lives forever, and a perfect body, and to come to the, back to the earth that's restored into a paradise on earth and live here and enjoy this all these this happiness and joy forever and ever. If that sounds appealing to you, uh, and we're just scratching the surface of all the great things we're going to be enjoying on eternity. If that is appealing to you now and you're saying hey heaven does sound good after all what do I have to do so I can have that uh, I want to know uh, how about brother Austin if someone says what do I what do I have to do so I can have that uh, that promise of eternal life in heaven what, what would you tell him brother Austin um, I tell him just what Christ said specifically quote for quote in John uh, 647 verily verily I say unto you he that believeth upon me hath everlasting life and I'll top that with one more thing, and that is that uh, we'll, we'll use what I call the facts about Christ, the gospel, and I'll say that uh, we know that Christ died for the sins of the world, was buried, and rose again three days later. We know that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that you can rest assured because he was not just a mere man. He resurrected, came back from the dead three days later, and now is seated at the right hand of God Almighty. Yeah, uh, it, 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 and if you're watching this, it, it's really that simple. Jesus said that uh, we need to get yoked to him. Just like two oxen are joined together by this yoke, uh, we get yoked together with Jesus. We get joined to him, arm in arm with him, and he said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's not requiring much from you at all if you're watching this now. 
He's just asking you to reject everything else. Reject all the religions of the world. Understand that there's not a religion that can save you. Reject all of the religious leaders. Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. The Pope can't save you. The Virgin Mary can't save you. Reject all of them and reject your own ability. Understand that you are incapable of working your way to heaven just by trying to be a good person. And understand that your situation is hopeless, And there, but there is one thing that you can do. Put your faith completely in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Put your faith completely in Him. If you depend on Him, He'll come through for you. But if you're, if you're depending on your own performance, you'll fall short and you won't get there. So put your faith in our Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God who became a man and died for our sins and rose from the dead. Trust Jesus. Okay? If you do that, make a comment in the comment section of the video, and uh, we would be real happy to hear about that. So uh, now this is actually Brother uh, Jackson's show. I can't even close the show. <laughs> so Brother Jackson, you get the final word, and then you can close the live broadcast. All right, all right. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. My guess is Luke will probably want to download this video and put it on his channel as well. Um, I would just, I just really appreciate everyone who's watched this, and the good thing about this is that we know that if one person's channel uh, isn't working, another person might. So I'm really glad we were able to have this discussion tonight, in spite of some early technical difficulties. So, and I'd just also like to say to all the panelists right now, you know, you all have channels, and you're capable of doing this too. If mine doesn't work, or if somebody doesn't work, so let's just make sure all to pitch in to make sure this goes out there, because we're talking about very important I'm not things your points here. Points are 100 right, uh, but there are certainly very interesting things to consider, and. Uh, uh, that's one of the things I enjoy about our hangouts is that, what is that? <laughs> um, even Joe Byron, uh, YouTube or something, has some 